to introduce you to our very special guest this evening. I'm so excited to have Ben back with us, not in Pennsylvania this time. Ben, ben joined us in November of uh, 2018 um, to present this topic and a lot has cha changed and some things haven't changed so much, but I'm really excited to have you with us. We're so grateful for our partnership with you and you've been such a great uh, help to us and we just, we just thank the world of you. So without further ado, here's Ben Court. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, this is a trip for me, and I hope that um, for everybody watching, you'll uh, be able to cut me a little bit of slack as I'm figuring this whole thing out, because um, the whole year changed, and, and this is the very first online talk that I've given. Uh, and if any of you have, uh, if you made it out when I was there in 2018, or if you've uh, seen me anywhere in the past, you might know that like uh, interacting and sort of being a part of, of the room that I'm in is a really important thing to me. Uh, it's, it's weird to be sitting here in my study uh, having a conversation with so many people in Pennsylvania and a, a little bit sad too because I'd already I had planned when Kim and I spoke last year I was going to come out and get to see my little sister and nephew and brother-in-law who are in Bucks County. Um, but of all of the places to be right now, um, I, I got to tell you that the rural outskirts of Boulder County are, are probably a little bit easier than um, the greater Philadelphia area. So my heart definitely goes out to all of you who are um, in, really in the middle of this thing. So let me try and share my screen and let's see if this works. I, I, I again, Bear with me a little bit. I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to be nearly as funny. And if any of you have seen me present in the past, you know I'm usually freaking hilarious. Um, so this is going to be interesting. Um, well, I, I guess I'm the only feedback I'll get. So so long as I'm amusing myself, then maybe there's something that has been accomplished here. Um, and I'm going to figure out how to do this whole thing. I asked Kim if the uh, uh, golf cert was okay. And she said, yeah, I mean, this is an online presentation. I think we pretty much expect everybody to be in a t-shirt and probably pajama bottoms at the bottom. And I want you to know, I am actually wearing pants, um, which is very unlike an interview I did multiple years ago, maybe three years ago with BBC. So if you get bored and you want to see something funny, and I probably shouldn't be saying this because it's recorded, but I'm going to anyway, um, I, I got a chance to do a piece on this topic with um, BBC a couple of years ago, and, and I just couldn't resist, man. They had you in like the little waiting room before you went live, and we'd already sound checked and everything, and I was on mute, and I, I actually had to do it in my desk, anchorman style, with a jacket and a tie on, um, and ditch the slacks. There, already too much information. This is going to be a great time. Um, let's see what I can do to teach you a little bit about marijuana in the 21st century and uh, throughout answer some of the questions that have come in. We had um, 53 total questions that came in prior to and uh, I've gone through all of them and have uh, tried to put some of them into um, broader categories so maybe I can answer them as a whole um, without uh, the specifics. And then there were about 15 of them that will actually be included in the presentation and then several of them that I would like to address directly. Um, my intent also is to leave some time at the end of this to answer any questions that might come in. Um, I can't see any of those because um, I'm about as ADD as they come. And um, I'm actually facing my window, which will be trouble if a squirrel runs by or anything. Um, so Kim and Judy are, are going to uh, go through those questions with us at the end. And I guess uh, Kim and Tessa are, Judy's just here for the, for the legal. Um, so first and foremost, uh, a little bit about your presenter. Um, I, I'll go quickly here because you can find this elsewhere and it's always a difficult thing to do, uh, walking that fine line between um, telling you why I have enough information that you should listen to me and sounding like an arrogant prick who, who you don't want to listen to. So first and foremost, from an um, uh, experience and qualification standpoint, I'm a dad uh, raising three school age kids in the weed capital of the world. Uh, we have been here since way pre-legalization, um, of course. Um, I, I grew up here. 
um, and we're in um, a, a community called Longmont, Colorado, Colorado which is uh, Boulder County, and Boulder is sort of where the weed's at. So um, for all of you East Coasters, um, and somebody who did a lot of this using on the East Coast, I would probably um, scoff at hearing this, but Colorado can teach you a little bit about weed. And being somebody who's got kids in school right now, um, I think I get a kind of unique perspective with it. So right here, but before I go any farther, let me encourage you to remember that the, the reality for my kids and for your kids, or for some of you, if you're listening, I can usually tell if there's kids in the audience so I can temper my language back, but um, since I can't see if there are any young ears, I'm just going to keep this PG as well as I'm able to. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like you to consider what it's been like for our kids through this and what it looks like for them. So for me at, at 41, um, weed has, always been illegal and it's always been something that was um in the shadows you know like certainly not at the same level of a lot of the other drugs but um it, it wasn't front and center and i think it's really important for me to contextualize the difference between um how these last couple of years have been for me and how they are for my kids because i really do remember them as the last couple of years uh colorado opened retail sales uh, in 2014. And so for a 41 year old, that's a pretty small blip in my life. Um, for my 16 year old, however, it's been her entire adolescence um, has had commercialized uh, marijuana sales with dispensaries all over the place and lots of smells and um, advertisements uh, everywhere she looks. Um, for my 14 year old, even a little bit more so, and realistically for my 11 year old, um, he doesn't really have too many memories of a world that, that doesn't involve um, retail marijuana sales. And so I, I think one of the tricks for us, and as I read through some of these questions, maybe one of the things that would help you in the onset is to think about the incredible difference in, in our perception of things as maybe a little bit farther down the line uh, and, and what it is for a younger generation who what we would consider this kind of current uh, climate of acceptance has always just kind of been a climate of acceptance for them. And it might help to start to bridge the gap a little bit because one of the problems that I see all the time is man, stuff gets lost in translation between us and the young people. And um, if we're not careful about that, we can end up making a lot of really good points and uh, just pushing people farther away instead of bringing them closer. Um, something else that influences my uh, perspective greatly is I'm, I'm somebody who's in recovery. I got, I got sober on the East Coast in um, uh, June 15th of 1996 uh, in DC. And uh, so I have been sober for 23 years. I was 18 when I got sober. And it's a really big part of my life and of my world. Uh, you know, the 12-step community is very important to me. And as such, I still do a lot of work with um, younger folks in recovery. And this has been a really interesting development for them. Um, I don't have to say interesting. Interesting if you're an academic. It's been a really tough development for a lot of them from uh, the seat that I'm in because um, the prevalence of has just made it harder. You know, it's basically, uh, it, it's a lot like alcohol in Colorado, the prevalence, and um, it's, it's tough when you see it and smell it and hear about it, and it's a big giant joke. So a lot of the times for people in early recovery, this is real challenging. Um, so I started um, in, in this field, if you will, in a little nonprofit um, that I got started with my climbing partner called Phoenix Multisport. Now it's called The Phoenix. Um, he's actually from Bucks County. And now, now it's a pretty large nationwide nonprofit. Uh, basically what we did was introduce people to sport as a way of staying sober. Um, and after five years of startup nonprofit, I joined the University of Colorado Hospital where I was from 2012 to 2017. And the reason why this is important is because um, that's right when we, so we, we uh, initiated retail sales in 2014. And that's when everything changed. Um, as you know, our vote was 2012, um, but we didn't actually start selling 
until 2014. And um, what the University of Colorado Hospital did, uh, if most of you probably aren't familiar with it, it's a, it's a safety net institution for one of the poorest communities inside of um, the Denver metro area, but it's also a major academic institution. So it's a school of medicine, school of pharmacy, school of dentistry. Um, and it, it's a safety net facility where a lot of people got their primary um, health care through the emergency department. And so we had an integrated behavioral health service line there, which um, basically worked to try to uh, get to some of the core issues of why so many people were coming back through the ED, uh, where we weren't necessarily treating the underlying psychiatric disorders and um, behavioral disorders that, that drove um, the problem use that brought it back. And as such, we had uh, an adult inpatient um, drug and alcohol treatment program. And my role there uh, oversaw the admissions and the business development and marketing of that. Um, and sitting over admissions, uh, saw some really, really interesting stuff happen fairly quickly, not right away, but fairly quickly. And it really um, drove home my interest in this conversation as I was watching such a shift in the, the patients who we were treating um, after we opened up retail sales. And, and not only a shift in who they were, but also a real developing um, communication gap between um, the kind of us and them, between the provider and the patient, is we tried to communicate things to them in a way that made sense to us, and they were living in a very different world. So while I was at the hospital, um, I wrote a book uh, called Weed Inc. Um, I, I don't think it's a very good book, but it, it might be an important book um, because it talks about some of the things that aren't being talked about. and. Um, talk some um, poor little publisher into buying it, which they probably regret. And now actually, um, oh, maybe they don't, Simon & Schuster bought it. So now it's, um, it's a Simon & Schuster publication. And uh, recently, I've written quite a bit, but usually they're just little articles and stuff. Um, recently uh, was uh, published in, in a forthcoming medical manual that's really exciting for if there's any physicians or pharmacists in there, um, you'll know Springer Publications. Uh, they, they publish most of the um, uh, medical textbooks for uh, med students in this country. And um, this fall, we have the very first, maybe um, August, we have the very first kind of comprehensive uh, evidence-based uh, look at all things cannabis in medicine. And I got asked to um, help write the recovery and treatment uh, chapter on that. So um, I wouldn't recommend everybody buy it because it's going to be a little bit kind of heavy on the reference side of things for physicians. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get permission to reprint that chapter because I think we, um, we uncovered some pretty cool stuff and maybe some new ideas on how to treat the cannabis dependent patient. Um, in 2017, I, I gave a TED talk um, that, that was called Surprising Truths About Legalizing Cannabis. And um, that's on their website, on the TED.com website. I actually got featured as the TED Talk of the Day for a week, which was really cool. Um, and then I spent uh, the last three years consulting inside of treatment, uh, professional and collegiate athletics. So uh, I've done a lot of work with the NFL, a little with the NHL, and um, continue to do work with them. But, uh, a lot of collegiate athletics, as well as organized labor. Um, and I've consulted with the U.S., multiple states, um, with the, the country of Canada as a whole, as they rolled theirs out. And um, this time last year was in New Zealand, um, helping them uh, weigh some of the things that they're their uh, parliament is trying to figure out with legalization. And uh, at the beginning of this year, I left the, the consulting thing and um, I joined a, a group of people who I've known and loved for a long time here in Colorado uh, at a small men's only treatment program in the mountains called The Foundry. Um, and I, I was offered and accepted the CEO position there. Um, so now I'm back in uh, full-time treatment, which I picked a hell of a time to do that right before this whole COVID business, because you can imagine what that's like um, in an inpatient drug and alcohol setting. And then a few more affiliations. I'm on the board of directors for something called NOWGAP, which is the National Association of Lesbian, Gay, Transgender, Bisexual Treatment Providers and their Allies. Uh, for the National Marijuana Initiative, or NMI, which is a project under the Office of National Drug Control Policy and Strategy. Um, the University of Florida, where I have a fellowship in their, um, uh, the think tank around 
drugs and alcohol, and SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. So there it is, a uh, little bit of an introduction. Now, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about. First and foremost, um, I am not particularly interested in what 52% um, of respondents say. Uh, not particularly interested in what a, a, um, uh, a majority of folks believe. What I'm interested in sharing with you here is real science. And real science is journal published and peer review. Um, and every uh, bit of data that I share with you is, uh, comes from a journal published and peer reviewed study. Um, I, I, I try to avoid um, the opinion pieces as much as I can. The only difference you'll see at the uh, bottom are some remarkable data that we have from um, the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA, who have put out five volumes of legalizing uh, marijuana in Colorado. A uh, couple other things that I draw heavily on, and, and let me just encourage you, um, as we are considering this incredibly contentious issue, to be careful with the spin. Because um, in a lot of ways, the marijuana conversation has just become another litmus test. Uh, you know, uh, how liberal are you? How conservative are you? Do you wear a mask? Do you hate a mask? How do you feel about weed? Um, and I have always thought that just because something has been politicized does not make it political. Uh, to me, this has always been a question of public health. And um, at the root of public health are individual uh, health. So we are, we are not coming from a place where we think that surveys are science. We're coming from a place where we think that science is science. First and foremost, a couple questions about this. So let me just hit it off the bat because freaking COVID. COVID and cannabis. No, <laughs> is the answer. Um, I have a very good friend who's the head of pharmacy inside of the Jefferson system um, out by you. And, and we were speaking last week and uh, it was specifically about what to do with so many patients who'd been intubated for so long. And as a result, developed um, a dependence on a lot of the drugs that they have to get you to, to tolerate um, having something that intrusive inside of your body. And, um, and we came to, he's one of the, uh, brightest uh, scientists I know. Uh, and it, he started telling me about all of the issues associated with cannabis use and COVID-19. And I took a bunch of notes and I started to put them on here and I thought, you know what, I, I can't take too much time and I'm not nearly as smart as Bill. Um, so let me just summarize it by telling you that um, overall the two of them don't mix. And something that we have always known about cannabis use, not just in its smoked form, but certainly in its smoked form, is um, it is not good for your immune system. It's not devastating for your immune system, but it, it's like right now we're really encouraging everybody to do everything that they can to have a very strong immune system. Because um, we want, well, <laughs> because it's obvious. Um, and so if for no other reason that's an issue, but there's fungal issues, there's uh, huge issues associated with vaping uh, and COVID-19 that we want to be very careful of. If you basically want to consider that more than anything, it's an attack on um, a person's lungs for the most part. Um, anything that's going to interfere with good lung function, uh, you really do not want to mix the two. Um, it, it, I know that it presents in different people different ways. Um, I, I had it two months ago and um, I've fully recovered. Everything's fine. Um, didn't feel necessary to put a mask on before this. Um, see, now I think that was kind of funny, but I can't tell if y'all thought it was funny, but I thought it was. Anyway, um, I didn't have a lot of the same um, symptoms that, that some people are having today, but I did have the really intense respiratory um, as well as the, the taste stuff and the fever and the chills and the inability to thermoregulate. Um, and I've talked to people who uh, it was totally different for them uh, than it was for me. So while it's not always a lung thing, it is primarily a lung thing. So um, simply, not a good idea. Let's not do it. All right. So give me 10 minutes to make a point that if... Um, you have ever seen me uh, speak before, you know, is kind of the crux of what I want to talk about. And don't worry, there's some new information in here for sure for you, um, but I can't get to it before I hopefully establish this with you. 
And the reason why I have to establish this is because um, a lot of us see the world through a construct in which cannabis uh, was, isn't a big deal. Because very frankly, um, it wasn't that big of a deal. And while there certainly were issues associated with its use prior to, there, there were. Um, most of them were with kind of intense pre-existing conditions. And there was an interesting question here uh, that, uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll read it verbatim. How can we shift the negative stigma of cannabis created by our government in the early 1900s to a positive natural medical outlook? Where can we start to be involved in understanding the plant properly? I'll answer the last first. Hopefully here tonight, you can begin to um, start to be involved in understanding the plant properly. But the reality is that the, um, the beginning of that question, I appreciate quite a bit uh, that the, um, a lot of the negative stigma did come from um, a, a really dedicated campaign that we ran. I, I don't think it was quite um, early 1900s. It was more 20s and 30s, where uh, we figured that um, by demonizing the devil's lettuce uh, would give us another really good excuse to lock up black and brown and yellow people. And it's kind of hard to argue against that when you see some of the things that were written. Uh, and for years, there's an old joke uh, that used to go around. I don't know if it still does, but it's to say that the most dangerous thing about marijuana is being caught with it. And I think for a long time, uh, there was really some truth to that. And so what we're, we're dealing with today is not what you smoked in the 70s. This is the new school cannabis. And it's interesting, I'll finish answering this question now, number 23, uh, that started with how can we shift the negative stigma of cannabis? Uh, and, and I would say that if you don't believe that the negative uh, stigma associated with cannabis has been shifted, you probably should watch a little bit more news um, or open up BuzzFeed or talk to anyone under the age of 35 because it's absolutely been shifted. And the way that it was shifted was with a, a massive influx of capital from um, you know, folks like Richard Branson and by organizations like the Drug Policy Alliance and uh, the Marijuana Policy Project and people who um, were looking to profit on it. So that is exactly how we already have shifted it. Um, anyway, back to the talk. Um, one of the problems that we have here is our understanding of this uh, substance is either first or second hand. And that's different than it is with a lot of substances. Um, I know that it's the most commonly used illicit substance in the country. Um, a lot of people on this uh, webinar, whatever the hell is, whatever it's called, um, a lot of you out there have consumed cannabis in some form or another. Um, and if you haven't consumed it personally, you know a guy. Every single one of you has an uncle, has a dad, has a brother, has a sister, has an aunt. We all know somebody who has consumed. And that's different than a lot of other drugs, uh, aside from alcohol and tobacco, where we all know people who uh, consume or have consumed those or we have ourselves. And, and the trick here is that we are seeing what's going on through that lens. And that lens is usually pretty old. So let me make a big, giant, bold statement, and then give me just a minute to back it up. Unless you have consumed a THC-based product that was purchased commercially in the last couple of years, your construct of what cannabis is is so antiquated that it's pretty irrelevant to this conversation. And I think for a lot of you, that might be kind of intense to hear because you're like, whoa, 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 man, you don't know what I did in the 70s. <laughs> you should have been at this one Joe Walsh concert. That's fantastic. I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you had a great night. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're talking about something that's so dramatically different. And part of the problem is that we take our perception of this drug, uh, this plant, and we apply it to the drug that the kids are consuming today, the young people are consuming today. So stick with me, let me prove that point for you. Because um, what happened was we had a shift from a market that was cannabis, when uh, you hear people say that word, um, it, it's referring to a plant, um, to a market that's primarily based around THC. 
Um, we're, we're not getting into uh, the, the other stuff, probably not tonight because we just won't have time for it. But THC, as many of you know, is, is the psychoactive component inside of cannabis. Very simply, if you don't have THC inside of cannabis, um, you have hemp. You have a very interesting textile. You have the thing that makes my favorite pairs of shoes. Um, you have a, a plant that doesn't intoxicate and got in a lot of trouble because it looked like a cousin of his. Um, THC is the part of the plant that gets you high. And what's happened in recent years, and, and I think maybe one of the most important things for you to understand is the relationship between THC and CBD. We all hear a lot about CBD, so we'll get to that in just a second. But understand that the commercial market is driven by THC. So you'll notice even a little bit of a shift in my vernacular right now. Um, I don't like to say um, recreational marijuana so much as I like to say commercialized THC. Um, I don't like to say uh, legal marijuana so much as I do commercialized THC. I think we should probably be a little bit more careful with our language because there's a huge difference between the cannabis plant um, and the THC-based products that people are consuming today. So. If, if you catch nothing else from this whole thing, I wish I could see what you're doing and, and if you're paying attention or not. And I, I hope that you are. So, so let's everybody, like the next two minutes, just give me the next two minutes and then go back to doing whatever, yelling at your kids or, or eating dinner or whatever you got going on. Um, you need to see these next two slides. So these data are, are phenomenal. And unfortunately, in all likelihood, we won't see a continuation of them um, because our federal government um, has been and continues to play games with this. But from 1960 until 2011, the University of Mississippi um, gave us th these data that are a representative sample of all of the seizures taken throughout the country, um, every state. And what this shows us, if you can see the red line on your screen, um, is the THC, so the psychoactive ingredient, the part that gets you high. And the purplish red line at the bottom is CBD. So that's the, um, that's the part of the plant, very simply, where the medicinal properties lie. Um, so if you meet somebody who wants to argue tooth and nail with you that there's no medicine inside of marijuana and the, um, all right, you've got my permission, throw out an okay boomer at them, um, because they haven't really paid too much attention to the data. There's absolutely medicine inside of this plant. Um, I want to be very, very clear though, medicine's not smoked ever under any circumstances, like ever um, have we decided that we should smoke our medicine. Um, the medicinal properties inside of it need to be um, pulled out and then delivered into the body in a um, reproducible and um, uh, consistent manner. And the medicine comes from the CBD. Now, the other really interesting thing that the CBD does and this is incredibly important for those of you who want to have the conversations with the young people in your life who so many of these questions were, were around it. Um, what the CBD does and has always done, re ready for this is crucial, CBD neutralizes the psychoactive component that is THC. So at a one-to-one -one ratio, cannabis will not get you high. Cannabis is something with some interesting medicinal qualities uh, for, for some limited stuff, but um, definitely is there. And probably some calming properties. Uh, it typically was something that you saw heart rates and blood pressures decline using. Um, but it wasn't something that got you high unless you smoked a ton of it or in, until we started to engineer and mess around with it a little bit. So follow with me on this red line, if you will, on your screen, because uh, I'm gonna highlight three really important things from um, this chart. And the first is that if, if you go back to 1960 here, were we to follow that line backwards into perpetuity to when humankind left the garden or crawled out of the ocean or came, climbed down from trees or wherever you are with that, if, if we were to follow it back into perpetuity, what we would see is that line staying consistent. Because what naturally occurs inside of cannabis sativa, and remember, we, we didn't have cannabis indica uh, in, until quite a bit later. What naturally occurs inside of cannabis sativa is um, somewhere between a 0.2 and 0.5% THC. 
That's natural. So for all of you asking the questions about how do I communicate um, to people who tell me it's natural, and there's very, first and foremost, that, that is what humankind interacted with for millennium. Prior to the late 60s, which um, it's, it's interesting when we actually know exactly what happened uh, with some guys bringing seeds uh, sewn into their clothing back from Afghanistan and, and starting to create some interesting strains here. Um, so that's one thing that I want you to understand is that until very recently, cannabis has been less than half of a percent THC. We actually have examples of this. Um, we, we've found it enshrined in tombs in Asia and Africa, um, enough to a point where, where they can run mass spec on it and tell us that, that um, it's always looked like that. So the other thing I want you to look at is the CBD line. And you'll note that they didn't actually even start tracking CBD until the mid 80s. And um, not really sure why. Uh, in, in all likelihood, it's because they didn't think that there was much value in it, is my guess. Um, but CBDs remained nationally constant. We stopped tracking it in 2008 as an um, aggregate. But the, the most interesting thing about these is, is naturally occurring. It's a one-to-one. -one. And it's not until you start to increase the THC um, that you start to really have the problems with it, that you have that psychoactive part of it um, getting higher and higher and higher. And then the part that was given naturally, the, the cool part of the plant, the, the, the gift here, the neat thing about it um, is being rendered more and more impotent because it, it's not able to keep that THC from doing things to the human brain um, that we don't really want it to do to the human brain. So when we say we go back into the annals of time and we say, well, cannabis has always been so benign and there's never been a problem. And a big part of that is because the CBD um, has been there to keep the THC in check. So at a one-to-one -one ratio, you're not gonna get high. The third thing that I'd like to share with you As you'll see throughout this, over the course of time, THC has gotten higher. And the reason being is uh, we like to get high. <laughs> we live in a country um, that supersizes Big Macs. <laughs> we live in a country um, that'll fight tooth and nail to, to have full strength alcohol in our stores, where if one is good, two is better. Um, and there was a demand for stronger, more THC rich um, weed. And as such, the market responded, the illicit market responded. And over uh, the course of these some 50 years, you will see how they um, bred stronger marijuana. Okay, so ready? This is the part you gotta pay attention to because I think this will answer a lot of the questions that came in, maybe about 10 of them. <laughs> um, I, I'm about to switch slides, but before I do, I want you to take one more look at this thing carefully because we are looking at increments of 2.5 over the course of 50 years, 51 years. Unfortunately, these data ended in 2016, and we won't have um, continuation of them, but these are increments of five over the course of six years. And when we put it together, what you see, blue is Colorado. And unfortunately, we can't give you these same data from other states, uh, and we can't give you a national data set because politics is stupid, and nobody's um, really holding accountable what's going on. But you can see the importance of this conversation here, I hope, that uh, very realistically, uh, what we did was in the last couple of years, we shifted um, from a plant that uh, for the most part was fairly benign um, to a drug that is not benign and has uh, presented some issues uh, that are catching folks off guard, even people who were paying very close attention is catching them off guard and are very concerning. So the bottom line is, as I showed you a couple before, this is what happens in the illicit market when uh, they get to meet our demand for a stronger drug. 
And this is what happens when you have commercial interests involved in that. This is what happens when you unleash the power of uh, American industry onto something. Um, we make it a whole lot stronger, a whole lot faster. So as you'll see by this, um, back to that statement that I made just a few minutes ago, um, unless you've consumed a THC-based product that was purchased commercially in the last couple of years, um, I'm afraid you're, you're just kind of talking about a different thing. And part of the problem is, is that's where these things get lost in translation. And we wonder to ourselves, you know, why, why can't I get through them? Why are they not listening? Why does this not make any sense? Why isn't the data um, translating? Um, and, and it's because we're, we're talking about something different. So I, I think I'm realizing one of the most intense things about this, Kim, we were wondering what it would be is probably the fact that there's like no break in talking. I'm getting irritated by the sound of my own voice. So give me a minute because arch. And um, let's switch slides here. <laughs> it's the difference between good gardening and good chemistry is what we're seeing today. And uh, I think it's really important for you to recognize this when you're having the conversations with uh, people who have grown up in a world like what my kids have grown up in. They've always known the chemistry side. Many of us uh, have always understood the gardening side. So shifting gears dramatically, uh, but don't worry, this isn't too much of a tangent. I, I, I should be able to come back pretty quickly for you. What is addiction? Um, addiction is uh, a word that we do actually don't use a ton anymore. What we use is a med medical diagnosis, which is, um, as many of you are mouthing right now, I hope substance use disorder or SUD. So in diagnosing a substance use disorder, you have to understand that you can't arbitrarily diagnose a substance use disorder, just like any other condition. You can't just like say somebody's got it and then bill insurance for treating it. Um, you have to demonstrate that they have it. So the way that we demonstrate substance use disorder is with these 11 criteria, which are found in the DSM. This is from the DSM-5, the most recent copy. And um, what, you, what you do is if a person answers in the affirmative to two or three of these criteria, it indicates a mild substance use disorder, um, four or five moderate, six or above severe. And so as we cook through these, and I hope you're, you're reading them right now because um, that's right in front of you. Um, as we read through some of these, you have to understand that inside of my field, inside of the substance use disorder treatment field, we don't distinguish between, um, I mean, we, we certainly treat them differently and we consider the um, idiosyncrasies between and certainly the physicians treat differently, the opiate addict versus the alcoholic or the amphetamine addict versus the benzo addict. Um, but we use the same criteria to diagnose all of them. So if it is alcohol or if it's THC, it doesn't matter. If you meet um, four or five of these criteria, you got it moderate, six or above, severe. With me? I can't tell if you are, so I why I asked. Good. <laughs> the other thing that happened, interestingly, was that the DSM, uh, three years ago, outlined objective diagnostic criteria for cannabis withdrawal. Now, I hope some of you right now perked up a little bit and are looking at your computer and you're like, okay, hold up. This guy was like, he had a little bit of credibility and then he started talking about cannabis withdrawal. Um, 10 years ago, if you would have talked about withdrawal from cannabis, like people would have laughed you out of the room. Um, I mean, maybe withdrawal from cannabis looked like you ate way less Rice Krispies and Yanni's music started to suck again. Um, I, <laughs> if any of you listen to Yanni, I've, I've been to two of his concerts one of them sober and at the and I'm like scratching my head 15 minutes in like what the hell did I ever see in this guy? Um, cannabis withdrawal would have been a bit of a joke. Uh, would have been something that we would have um, said, yeah, maybe there's some psychological withdrawal to it. But what you have to understand now is the medical manual um, gives you objective criteria for the physical withdrawal from cannabis. And that, um, if nothing else, to everybody who's paying attention should tell us how different um, these drugs are today than the plants of the past. Because the idea of becoming physically dependent on that plant, um, physically dependent to a point where you would withdraw from it, 
it's kind of nutty. And interestingly, I, I had a long conversation uh, with a physician friend of mine yesterday. We socially distanced, sat apart, and um, had, a, had a glass of tea and talked because he's given a presentation on this uh, to a bunch of docs. Um, I guess he did it today. And um, we were going through all of the really interesting um, issues associated with specifically treating the physical withdrawal from cannabis and why it's so tricky. Uh, it's very tricky and hopefully it's something that um, my field uh, is going to be able to give people more information on. But for right now, know that it's real and know that for those of you who ask those questions, you know, why is it so hard and why can't my kid quit? And um, Because there's a physical component to it as well now. And uh, it, it would just do us good to recognize that. All right. So here's some, some new data, even if you've seen this slide before. We finally got 2019's numbers uh, about a month ago, which was pretty exciting, uh, six weeks ago. So when we started in 2014, we had fewer than 300 cannabis facilities in the whole state of Colorado. Um, in 2017, that number jumped to 1,190. And in 2019, that number jumped to 2,709. That's a really big difference. And if I could get into the office and have somebody help me create a graft, uh, graph, graph, <laughs> graft, <laughs> um, somebody help me create a graph, I could, uh, you, you would see how profound this is. But to go from 300 to 2,700 in a period of five years is pretty remarkable. So the question that we ask ourselves um, is how can Colorado support this amount of retail? And it's very simple. We can support this amount of retail because there's a demand for it. Uh, if there wasn't a demand for it, we could not continue at this breakneck growth pace. It wouldn't work. Um, and so how does that growth um, continue? And it continues, uh, there, there's only two ways. Simple. <laughs> um, you convert current users to more frequent users or you capture new users. There's just no other way to add to that market. Capture new users, convert current users to more frequent users. So with all of that in mind, we come to the old 80-20 rule that we've used inside of um, prevention and treatment um, for a long time. We got about 40 years of data from SAMHSA showing us, uh, and, and that is that 80% of the booze in this country is consumed by about 20% of the consumers that to the industry as a whole, to the purveyors and the people who are selling and their livelihood depends on, um, my wife and her three or four margaritas a year don't matter. Who matters was the guy who found Mad Dog 2020 when he was 12 years old. Um, which was a, oh God, that was a bad, that was a long night. Um, the industry is built on a need for the problem user to contribute to it. So in Colorado, the best data that we've got for you is still we're 2017 on this. I hope the state releases some new data for 2019, but they haven't yet. Is that 84% of the THC in the state of Colorado is being consumed by 20% of the consumers. So who that 20% is, uh, we could use a lot of pejoratives to describe them, or <laughs> we could simply... Um, consider that these are people with a substance use disorder who in all likelihood are meeting um, four, five, six and, and above of these diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder. This industry is dependent on the problemed user. It's interesting, a lot of the times people will say, uh, oh yeah, well the, the industry uh, gets all of their money from the, the tourism to Colorado. Um, and I think that's funny that people think that. If you come out to Colorado and you're going to go skiing in Breckenridge for the weekend and you stop at the dispensary um, in Idaho Springs on your way up and, and you pick up a couple of gummy bears, fantastic. Don't drive. Don't let kids see you. I hope you stay safe. And um, the industry doesn't care at all about the 15 bucks that you just gave them. Who they need are the people who are consuming. So the people who make up that 20% consume on average eight times a day. Who they need are those problemed users. This industry can't exist without it. Same as tobacco, it can't exist without it. Let's create that problemed user. 
there are four contributing factors, and only four, <laughs> to um, create that, that problem user, that person who's going to end up in that 20% consuming 84% of the total product. The fourth one we have no control over, it's genetic predisposition, so we might as well not mention it. Um, it's age of onset, it's frequency of use, and it's potency. If you want to build a problem user or a reliable customer and a long-term source of income for your industry, these are the three greatest factors you can consider. Age of onset, frequency of use, and THC potency. Now, um, age of onset, there was a study that just came out that, that said that most people <laughs> say that 19 is the ideal age uh, that people should be allowed to purchase cannabis. Um, most people are wrong if they actually think that. Uh, where we should and where the use goes dramatically, uh, I'm sorry, the problem with use goes dramatically down um, is when somebody has a fully myelinated frontal lobe when their brain, the front part of the brain, is fully developed, the executive thought part. And that um, is in your mid-20s. So for ladies, it typically takes place uh, 23, 24, 22. Um, for guys, it typically takes place 25, 26. Um, and once your frontal lobe is myelinated, think of it as like a case on your phone. Um, you can get away with dropping it more. You probably shouldn't be dropping it all of the time, um, but you can get away with dropping it a little bit more. But before that, your brain is much, much more susceptible to the issues associated with THC. So any use in adolescence, and adolescence is pre-mid-20s, is going to lead to higher use rates. Frequency, so the thing that I, I ask people to consider with this is the, the same thing um, that I would ask them to consider with alcohol. Since I don't know um, many people who consume marijuana just for the taste or THC just for the taste, um, typically, if not pretty much always, somebody's consuming THC, it is to get intoxicated, which is different than alcohol. Because I know plenty of people who have a glass of wine with dinner or a beer while they're watching a ball game and they're not doing it to get drunk. Um, but we typically don't use THC with any other intent than to get high. So if you knew somebody who was drinking with the intent to get drunk, frequently, we would be concerned. I mean, much more than hmm, once or twice a month or so, and I'd probably want to have a conversation with them. Certainly more than once a week, and I would be concerned. So any use that looks like um, more than that is of concern. And potency, this is when it gets a little bit scary, especially getting into what we're going to get into. Um, any potency that is north of 10% is of chief concern. And I know that was a specific question in here. So potencies that are above 10% are when we really start to see um, the, the worst effects. The earlier somebody starts, um, the more likely they are to be dependent. The more frequently they use, the more likely they are to be dependent. And the higher the potency, the more likely they are to be de dependent. So let's take a quick look at the industry in Colorado. Oh, God, I'm going slow. Um, that is a picture of a dispensary in Colorado Springs with Cookie Monster on the side of it with a plate full of dope. <laughs> they actually got a cease and desist from Sesame Street. Um, listen, they're not selling weed to a five-year-old who walks in because he saw Cookie Monster. What they're doing is waging kind of long-term hearts and minds campaigns, um, where if you remember Spuds McKenzie and, and Joe Camel and stuff, make that look like kiddie play. These are um, branded with things that kids know and love. If you look closely, it's not a Kit Kat, it's a Keef Cat. It's a Buddha Finger. Um, it's a Twixt. Um, I don't know if any of you have visited the Kush Moji. Um, app on the iTunes store, but you can download a bunch of emojis that are THC specific, which for most people might not mean anything, but if um, you, you know the culture, they mean quite a bit. Again, not, not something that's really geared towards the, uh, the responsible adult. Um, this was a back to school special in Colorado a couple of years ago, really. Um, but again, that's not towards grownups. This was a uh, section in, a magazine, in the Boulder Daily Camera that they gave all of the kids uh, in um, going from junior high to middle school. I'm sorry, from middle school to senior high when my daughter was doing that two years ago. And in the very beginning of it, the first page is a, a half page full color ad for a dispensary called Starbuds. 
Um, and she came up, uh, they gave her this at school because it's the insert, you give them to pick what school you're gonna go to. And she said, at first I thought it was a ad for Starbucks and then I looked closer. <laughs> There's a move-in special at CU Boulder, a spring break special. Here's Santa Claus with a bag full of dope. Again, more geared towards the kids, I think. Look, speaking of the Christmas theme, we got rid of baby Jesus and replaced him with a dab rig in Colorado. Um, frequency, smoke weed every day. Listen, I don't care how myelinated your frontal lobe is, please don't smoke weed every day. We actually start to see changes in the, in the physical structure of one's brain at this kind of frequencies to be very careful, please. Um, don't forget to dab daily, dab being the verb of concentrate consumption, which I'll share with you in a moment. We have pre-rolls to make it more convenient. We have these things, if I could translate this for you, elevate your adventure, get as high as you can. It's get, get high and do everything. Get high and go skiing, get high and go climbing, get high, get high and go hiking. We've got all these uh, advertisements here. And then potency, I'll just highlight this quickly. It says, bud tenders are trained to have their most potent products at the ready when asked for a suggestion. I go to dispensaries all the time. And um, that is the truth. And the reality is that it is a difficult message to counter um, when I get asked, and remember that this is kind of like my world, when I get asked to sit down and have a conversation with a young person about this, um, it can be a difficult Call it message for me to count because while well, I say, hey, listen, maybe it's not for you. Maybe this is a grown up thing. Maybe, maybe, and, and they have grown up with a teddy bear riding the roster rocket over the flat irons, which makes it really hard for them to throw the okay boomer at me. I don't have any idea what I'm talking about and I'm out of touch because this is the imagery that they have always known. And for those of you in states that don't have legal in the same way yet or recreational in the same way yet, um, this messaging crosses state lines quite a bit and is shared quite a bit. And the idea is because the money behind these legalization movements um, is not small at all. I mean, uh, we're pretty realistically, there's lots of different numbers I share and I pulled them all out of this because I didn't think it was super relevant. Um, but you, you are um, well north of $15 billion annually being generated inside of this industry. And you better believe that those guys know what they're doing. And, and I say guys, um, not because I'm not careful with my language, but because I mean guys. Um, there are, um, <laughs> 80% of all of the dispensaries in Colorado are owned by 14 people. Every single one of them is a white male. Everyone. Um, it's an industry uh, made up of that. That's what I gave my TED talk about if you want to watch that sometime. So let's hurry up and get to consumption trends because I think that this is very important for, for you guys out there. And um, Kim, I'm going to do my, my best to kind of wrap this up in the next 20 so we can get to questions, but you might have to stay on a minute late if you want people. Kim, you there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm glad you, I, I forgot to say that at the beginning, if we need to run long, Ben has agreed to hang with us um, until uh, as long as nine o'clock our time. Uh, it's early in Colorado, so he'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but thanks for that, Ben. And if, and if anybody does need to leave, um, we really would love for you to stay for the Q&A, but um, we are recording this. Um, but anyway, just, I'll let you keep going. <laughs> thanking me for staying on until nine. This is an excuse to be in my study with the door locked until nine your time. I've been in quarantine with my three children for the last three months. We're cool, kid. We're cool. So consumption trends. We want to look at three things. Concentrates, edibles, and vaping. The reason why we want to consider concentrates so specifically are that um, to date, the highest valid research that we have that looks at what a, a high potency cannabis is, is um, goes up to 16%. So north of 16% THC, um, we see trends and we have lots of anecdotal and um, it, it's, it's not good. It's pretty concerning and alarming stuff. But uh, humankind's collective knowledge about high potency THC ends at 16%. Uh, it's the Lancet Journal, February 2015, volume two, number three. It's been replicated twice since. What we see at 16% is that daily use increases the risk of five uh, of psychosis fivefold. That was, um, in, in this group, it was um, five times a week, they called daily. They called weekend use twice a week, and that's on increase in the risk of psychosis threefold, and a quarter of all of the psychosis in the study was causal. 
by. It wasn't uh, correlation. It was isolated as causal by the high potency THC. So in 2016, oh, not 2026, <laughs> in 2016, this guy, Ralph Morgan, who sold a lot of concentrates, um, said on a uh, Denver Post show um, that Colorado will sell more concentrates in 2017 by the flower or than, than the flower I see concentrates as being a part of people's daily regimen. And Ralph was absolutely right. Uh, so here's the data. Um, th this is from a, a fun little report that the state puts out um, to not enough fanfare every year. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you what concentrates are if you don't know yet. I keep referring to this thing you don't understand. But um, in 2014, the word concentrate or any variation of is found absolutely nowhere. 2015, they talk about it only as uh, it, it involved contaminants from some other things. In 2016, they say the same thing. 2017's report, however, says we sold 27,890 pounds of concentrates, which totaled 4.5 million units. And in 2019, again, the data that just came out, we sold 40,229 pounds of concentrate in 2019. We sold in the white market. We taxed the sale of. And if you can see this little thing over here on your right, look at the top line. It says cannabis concentrates are potent. Start by consuming a small dose about half the size of a pinhead or less. <laughs> At half the size of a pinhead or less, last year we sold 40,229 pounds in the above ground market of these. We sell more concentrates in the, in the state of Colorado by value than we do the flour. That means that in this, the country's first great retail exper experiment, concentrates are marijuana. When you go into a dispensary, it is more of this than of the flower. And the reason why I'm focusing on this so much and drilling at home is because I'm about to show you some stuff that I think for a lot of people, you're going to be like, hey, yeah, right. That's fringe stuff. Maybe the hardcore kids are using that. Maybe it's not. This is mainstream. People are initiating on this. People are consuming multiple grams of this daily. I know because we, we treat them. Um, this isn't fringe use. I, I have a friend who did an interview not too long ago, and he described it as um, weaponized THC. And it's only a couple years old, about four. What is a concentrate? Concentrates, uh, we refer to a lot of times as crackweed. That's what this was. Um, we refer to as crackweed, and you will see can reach potency levels of up to, it's a difficult thing to achieve, but it's achievable, 99.99% THC. That would be in something called a distillate, a concentrated THCA. <laughs> Remember the 16% thing. Remember 10 years ago, the 12% thing. And remember 40 years ago, the 4%, 2% thing. And before we started messing with it in the late 60s, the 0.5% THC. That's a pretty significant jump. And it's happened so quickly that we haven't had the ability to keep up with it and tell you this is what happens when you consume this. But we do know that to answer another specific question in here, addiction rates are, are considerably, considerably higher the higher the potency goes. Um, and it's, uh, won't, won't bother with all of the details on it, but um, a, a factor of up to about four times more. So how do you consume a concentrate? The main ways are certainly the preferred way is through a, um, a vape, a vaporizer. And there's lots of different ways, lots of different vapes to do this. I'll cover those in just a second for you. But most concentrates get consumed inside of a vaporizer. Um, here's a, an example of what they're calling a professional aromatherapy kit. Um, the, the harder form concentrates, I'll show you all the forms in just a minute. Um, the harder forms really like about 700 degrees to um, 
to, to, to do what they do the best. So uh, being able to plug something into the wall and then just drop it on a superheated needle is a really good way to do that um, versus a, a blowtorch. Uh, listen, I grew up in, in DC in the mid nineties after we left Boulder. And um, I'll tell you that the pipes that looked like that we were using for very different things. That's a marijuana pipe. And we use torches to consume concentrates. This is uh, email or, or kind of a, um, it's that on a much, much smaller scale and um, with a button that you press instead of using a lighter to do it. Um, I have lots of videos on how to, to make it and what happens when people are consuming. And I think what I'm gonna do is skip over the making it and tell you essentially um, what happens. There's so many different ways to make it now. What you're doing is pulling the THC using some sort of solvent or some sort of other method out of the uh, organic material and then refining it. And you refine that, refine that until you get the desired potency. Um, we actually even now have the ability to, to get this in Boulder. This is a closed loop extraction system that I can buy for about two grand in my house, um, which in the uh, uneducated hands can also be a bomb. <laughs> but uh, um, you can make it uh, gravity. You, you can press uh, out of it. it. It's certainly much cleaner. Um, but you're, you're not going to get nearly as potent. Um, so let's watch a couple things about trends. I have no idea if the, um, Kim, actually, can you tell me if the audio is translating because I don't want it to. The uh, camera in the background, I guess I'm about to do this 2.7. So we're hearing, we're hearing the audio. Is that, you don't want to hear the audio? Let me try this. If you no. mute, if you mute, it'll probably not. How's that? Any audio? No, you're good. Okay, good. I'm nervous some of your kids might be around. Listen, I'm less concerned with this. This guy's taken seven grams of it at once, which I'll, I'll tell you, Kim asked me how people justify the use, and I'll get to that in a second. What I'm more interested in, check this one out. All right, so this guy, probably a pretty dedicated cannabis consumer um, because he's wearing a cannabis shirt, hat, his medallion is, he's talking a whole lot about weed. He's at this party and he's got a pound of weed with him um, and he's going to take his first concentrate hit. And so they're going to warm the needle up and you're going to see, interestingly, what he's going to do is he's actually rolling a blunt um, for when he's done because it's you know, just weed. He's going to take his first hit of concentrate. It's a tiny, look how tiny that amount is. It, it hits really, really hard. He's out. Here's the reason why I thought this one was so interesting was because this is this is a really big dude uh, i mean you can't really tell I'm, I'm he's got to be well over 200 pounds and he takes a concentrate hit at this open house this is a security camera you can see as many of these things as you want to online. Just throw it into YouTube. Um, kids are stupid, they put everything online. I hope that if you only watch one, you watch my friend Stoners Are Weed on his channel, Kill a Friend Day. Kill a Friend Day. So what he does is he gives dedicated marijuana users their first concentrate hit and he films what happens. And it's pretty incredible, um, some of the stuff that you see. You see acute psychosis, and you see vomiting, and you see, you, you see all sorts of really wild things. Um, and the reason why I like this one so much is the contrast. So Stoners Are Weed is the big guy who's um, consuming the concentrate right now. So I want you to notice a couple of things. First, he clears this tube like there's nothing to it. He gets every little bit. And if you'll notice... There's no real change in affect whatsoever. And as he continues to talk, again, it's a bit profane, so I won't do it. As he continues to talk, there's no real change in affect. Um, he's not what we would describe as, as high 
even though he just consumed a really large amount of concentrate. So um, what I want you to see is the contrast between him and his buddy here, who um, he's given his first concentrate hit. Now first, you'll notice that when this young man hits it, um, he, he really only gets a, a pretty small amount of it into his lungs because he coughs so quickly. He doesn't really get um, the full hit at all. I'm close to the full hit. So um, what you're, you're not going to be able to hear, but what he's saying, he's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, there are um, allergic reactions to cannabis uh, that as more people consume, we see more frequently. They're rare, but they certainly do happen. There's actually um, anaphylaxis that can be associated with cannabis use. But he gets breathing again. And interestingly, for those of you in my field, what I want you to notice are, are some of, a couple of behaviors here that are really, really atypical of THC use. I do a lot of training for law enforcement, or at least used to. Um, and one of the things I try to talk to them about is to look for different signs and symptoms of use where they definitely might have not thought cannabis. You might have thought a synthetic rather than cannabis. So you start to see some, um, uh, in all likelihood, obsessive tactile behavior from this young man, where you'll see him kind of start to rub on the ground and get a little bit fixated with it, which is something that we typically associate with um, like synthetic party drugs. That's a, uh, that's a MDMA thing and, and stuff like that. Uh, when people have used synthetics, that's where they can't stop, you know, petting something or feeling something and um, not at all behavior typical with cannabis consumption. So listen, if um, we're usually in a room, and I know if, if some of you guys are chuckling right now, okay, great, fantastic. I'm <laughs> if you've actually ever seen um, psychosis or cannabis-induced psychosis, um, that's not funny, like in, in the slightest. Um, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty scary. I've seen, um, uh, literally, I have seen, in the correct use of the word literally there, uh, dozens of acute instances of cannabis-induced psychosis in the last couple of years. And the thing that's so interesting about it, and the, the conversation I was having with my friend yesterday, um, we see some of these people not coming back. And so there was a question in here, a very thoughtful one, about how long after stopping um, can I expect my child to fully come back? And the answer to that is we simply don't know. Um, we know that the endocannabinoid system is very different than a lot of the other systems, and we're not seeing it repair itself in the same ways. Um, we know that the use of these higher potency things is, um, is doing different things and overwhelming that system than has ever happened to it in the past. And one of the things Kim asked me as we were earlier today scrolling through a list of um, for sale items in a local dispensary, and we got to one of those super high potency ones, she said, well, what's the justification for? Why will people say, we need that, we sell that? And I said, typically the justification is they say, well, listen, it's like Everclear. And you're not going to drink a six pack of Everclear. You're going to take a shot and you're going to be done. So they're going to consume less of it. And it'll be good for their lungs because they're not using more. I mean, there's a number of things that you would want to counter there, but the, the first one is that, uh, and maybe the most important, is that it doesn't take into account um, the way that uh, depend, uh, I'm sorry, um, oh, what's the word, tolerance um, to THC is different than tolerance from alcohol. And I like that last video because it highlights it. It shows the one guy consume, I mean, easily twice as much and not have any change. And then it shows the other guy consume and it devastates him. But if he continues to consume that, he will get closer and closer and closer to that. You don't even see a change in the affect. And so that's why people are consuming so much of it, multiple grams of this a day, not even necessarily to get high anymore, but to get baseline. So the problem is, is that as you and I, um, in our fields, with our families, doing the things that we care about, if we are trying to have conversations with kids about the, the, the cannabis of days past, it's sort of like trying to teach them how to drive in this Model T that'll get going, you know, like 30 miles an hour downhill when, when they've been ripping around town at 240 in a Bugatti for the last couple of years. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? That's not weed. This, this is weed. Because back in my day, 
back in many of your day, if you saw that one to the far left, that, that gorgeous thick bud, if that came in a bag to the far left years ago, you'd be like, man, you know what? That's weed. That's weed. But today, as we move from left to right, it looks more like butter and wax and shatter. Today, this is weed. This is what they're selling in stores, and it's what uh, they are consuming. That's cannabis today. This is something called a live resin, um, which, they're, they're, listen, the definitions of these go on forever and ever and ever. Again, I wrote about a lot of them in my book, but they're, they're out there. I've written articles about it. I'm not going to go through all of them. But these are all different forms of marijuana. This is today's marijuana. Uh, Gorilla Glue and Bruce, Bruce Blanner and UK Cheese. And this is it. If you haven't seen it yet here, um, it's called a distillate, pure THCA. So these distillates are where you push those upper 90% THC. And we just looked at your local dispensary. And of course, they have a couple of them for sale there. Um, but uh, if you can imagine, this is what it is, looks like before it cools. Um, if you can imagine the, the amount of technical acumen that it takes to go from a green organic material to that, it's, it's pretty profound. I mean, this isn't Cheech and Chong growing solid skunk um, down underneath the false pool. This is uh, folks with PhDs um, and applied scientists who are doing pretty incredible things with it. This is cannabis today. So is this and this and this. And I want to quickly listen here. Stop saying 420. 420 is old. Uh, you sound old when you say, say 710. 710 is oil spelled upside down. So if you really want to get them, if you want to check and see what, uh, what Junior's up to um, at dinner tomorrow night, be like, well, hey, you know, it's 710 somewhere and see if they perk up. And if like, dad, what the hell? You got them. You got them. Don't say 420, you sound old. But there still exists this idea. If you can read that, it says, are you going back to nature? Don't forget your natural cannabis. We are concentrate headquarters. There still exists this belief that it's natural and concentrates aren't natural and they're being pushed everywhere. Free, free, free. I'm tight on time, so I'm going to hurry a little bit. Vaping. The biggest thing you need to understand about vaping, if you can see that on the left, it says no smoke, no smell, no mess. You can vape any of these things in <laughs> amazing fun flavors and no cannabis smell. Um, we could vape it on the other side of the room and you wouldn't know. Uh, so that's kind of gone. Uh, vaping comes in lots of stealth ways. Um, that's actually a functional pen. That's also a vaporizer. That uh, cup that heats to 700 degrees is great for the home or the office. Uh, and that's for vaping THC concentrates. The Zippo, same thing. The um, uh, asthma inhaler, same thing. V uh, vaping concentrates. And there's your classic bubblegum flavor one. The biggest lesson that you need in, in vapes is they can be in anything. I mean, there's sweatshirts with them with the um, one side of the hood you um, inhale from and then the other you sort of exhale into. Um, anything can be a vaporizer and there's no smell associated with it. So that's the most important thing. So now edibles, very, very quickly. 10 milligrams is a legal dose. So we would assume that in this package of 10 gummy bears by the company Edipure, um, that you have one legal dose in each. Um, it's not correct. There's actually 100 um, milligrams in each gummy bear with a warning on the back of the package that says separate each gummy bear into tenths. Consume and wait 40 minutes before consuming more. So there was a specific question that came in about overdosing on this. And um, overdosing is uh, unintended adverse reaction. Overdosing is not death. Overdosing can absolutely be associated with death. But overdosing is an unintended adverse reaction. And there are dozens of overdoses to THC every day and in, in my state. And it's typically because people will eat too much of a concentrate because they don't um, nibble the ear off of a gummy bear, uh, wait 40 minutes and see what happens because they pop the whole thing in their mouth and then 20 minutes later, they're like, what the heck? And they pop another thing in their mouth and they've consumed 20 doses. Um, 
years ago, Maureen Dowd from um, the, the Times wrote an interesting piece called Don't Harsh My Mellow uh, about consuming an entire cookie one night in Colorado where she was supposed to cut it into eighths and what happened. But the majority of the problems that we see, the acute problems, the people um, who are, are doing um, hurtful things or violent things or very, very foolish things that take lives, um, most of them are happening when they have consumed too much edible. So I want you to understand how easy that is to do. Oh, first, I'm glad I put this picture in. Check that out. That's uh, this is pretty new. That's a THC distillate inside of a gummy. So we are now infusing um, edibles with the distillates that I just showed you. Um, and so the, the weight doesn't matter on that, even though you could only have um, 10 milligrams inside of it. It's the potency on that. So putting a distillate inside of a Edibles are a pretty big deal. Here, this one, this is the record so far that I've seen. That's a uh, graham cracker size bar that's got a thousand doses, so 100 legal servings in it. Um, and here, here's your general rule. If it can be introduced into the human body, it's being commercially produced with cannabis in it. These products might surprise you. Uh, ketchup and condiments and coffee and K-cup coffee and lemonade. This is all THC infused ice cream and candies and granola bars, THC infused nasal mist. Um, so you wouldn't hear that. A topical THC, which you actually had quite a bit on in the local store that I looked at there. So that's a intoxicating topical. Um, you're not going to smell or feel that or anything. There's a THC swallowable pill that'll get you high. THC lollipops, THC tea, THC bites. Um, Here's a, a THC um, Reese's. That's actually, that's real. Uh, pot rocks, um, it's real. Uh, it's not a joke or facsimile. Um, sweet tarts, THC infused alcohol, THC infused soda. You wanna watch this one on YouTube tonight. Check, look at the, the bottom, it says Keef Cola. Uh, there's 35 uh, legal servings in it. That cap is 1 35th of it. So on the bottle, it says only consume one cap at a time. If you watch the kids on YouTube drinking this stuff, they're not consuming 1 35th. And you can see some intense stuff that happens. You keep up with rap culture. Here's THC infused syrup, um, THC juice. And there, there it is, weed water. <laughs> We've created THC infused water. So we really can anytime, anywhere, man. Chai tea and juice and mints and Swedish fish and blah, 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 blah. THC, uh, a five-hour energy, THC deodorant to put under your arms to get you high, THC-infused breast spray, and here it is, THC-infused lube, <laughs> which, I don't know, make sure it's FDA-approved before you put stuff there. THC-infused suppositories, which I actually bought. There's a documentary, I think it's on Netflix now, called Potluck, um, and I'm, I'm buying these, and I'm... Um, oh. God, how did I do this? You know what, dang it. Kim, what I wanna do is go through a couple of these specific questions um, and, and just uh, make sure that I, I wanna offer this presentation to anybody in the world who wants it, but I wanna be respectful of all of your time. The bottom line that I have here that, that I want you to understand about cannabis and mental health is the two do not go well together at all. These higher potency cannabises and mental health do not go well at all together. And there are things that, um, to me, this is the great story. And I think that just like my generation grew up kind of looking at the, the one before saying, God, I can't believe there was a time when you didn't accept and understand the association between tobacco use and cancer. I, I think that in a very few years to come, people will be saying, man, I, I can't believe there was a time when uh, you didn't see that link between uh, mental health disorders and high potency THC because they are, they are significant. So here are a couple of things I will point out to, to you. Acute physical health consequences include things that are very, very bad for driving uh, and something that we, uh, we see a lot of issues with people behind the wheel, the uh, motor coordination and reaction time. Chronic use. So over an extended period of time, and coming back to the one question we had, when can we expect it to get better? Um, we actually see a, a change in the physical structure of the brain. So that is loss of gray matter, white matter, and connective tissue. And we have actually seen a, um, not a coming off line of, but a true shrinkage, an actual shrinkage of the frontal lobe. And we don't know if, when, how that comes back. 
Um, we know that uh, what we're seeing right now is not super encouraging with it. However, on the other side to that, the minute somebody stops, we start repairing. And I know so many people who've gone through some really, really tough stuff and have come out the other end and made it just fine. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe we lose a step. Maybe I've lost a step uh, from what it could have been. But what it is right now is still really beautiful. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. We want to stop as soon as we can. Uh, I included some testing stuff for you, which I'm not going to take the time for. And then here's a couple resources. There's uh, what the book looks like. Uh, here's all of the references for those of you at the end of it who want it. And now, um, Kim, I'm going to just run through a, a couple of these questions, if that's cool. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, um, so I highlighted uh, a few of these, um, but I, um, there was a real theme, and the theme was how do I communicate with um, the young person, the loved one in my life who's got a problem. And I'll tell you the same thing that, that I uh, have been saying for a couple of years now that seems to work a, a little bit. Um, we usually role play it, so I don't even know how to work right now. Um, but you have got to come to it um, from a place of asking more than accusing. And one of the things that scares me a little bit about giving these talks is, is I don't want to give um, information and then have it go be weaponized. Because usually the last thing in the world um, that the people who you love, who need to hear the truth, are going to respond to is that. <laughs> what they're going to respond to is you listening and uh, asking them some questions and trying to uh, get through to them in a way that matters. So here's the best way that I have found to reach the person who doesn't want to be reached and who tells you it's not a problem, I'm fine, and it's better than, it's safer, whatever. You, you tell them um, you're, you don't have a problem with THC, right? And they say, no, of course not. You can't get addicted to it, it's natural. Don't even fight that fight. So, okay, great. If you can't get addicted to it, and this is a conversation I have with a lot of athletes, collegiate and pro. So if you can't get addicted to it, then let's prove to coach, prove to me that you're not addicted to it. I say, sure, yeah, how do I do that? I say, go 60 days abstinent. Can you stop for 60 days? If you get an answer like this right away from them, that's like, I do it all the time. I, I call it a... Um, tolerance reset. Snoop does it every year um, for a month. If you get that answer from him, I'd be pretty, I'd be less concerned. So, okay, cool. Like, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Like, maybe wait until you're in your mid-20s here, man. Like, let's not go overboard. Um, but usually what we get is a little bit of a him hum. Well, I could, but I don't want to, and blah, blah, blah. What you want to do is try to get them to agree to abstain for 30 days. 60 days is ideal because it's really a full cycle, but 30 days, you'll get a full cycle. And if you can get them to abstain for 30 days and make a deal with you, shake your hand on them, uh, shake their hand, uh, the, the thing that you need to get is to make sure that it's validated with testing. Because especially for you parents, I, I can't tell you enough how tricky it can get when you're um, the one who has to determine if they're telling you the truth or not. A lot of you already know this, that that, that can be so challenging. You're, you're calling them a liar when they're telling the truth and you're believing them when they're lying. Um, so what you want to do is set up a pre-established testing regimen prior to. So you're going you're gonna to abstain for 30 days and you're going to prove to me it can be done and I'm going to get off your back. But during those 30 days, you're going to be tested. Um, because that's the only way we can validate it. Just don't get into the uh, trying to determine whether or not they're telling you the truth. Just establish testing prior to. And then the next thing I ask them to do is to keep a journal. And um, I, I will tell you that of all of these journals that I've looked through, and there's been one or two, they're fairly consistent. Day one, this is so stupid. Day two, this sucks. I can't sleep. Day three, I can't eat. Day four, oh, I found my mountain bike. It turns out it's really beautiful at Chautauqua Park this time of year. Things are going great. And then day seven, they stop writing because they're high. Um, so what you can do then is use that with them. You can come back to them and show them that 
um, journal as this progresses. And fortunately, since people don't die from acute overdose from this, you do have a little bit more time. You can sort of play the long game with them. And because what you got to do is you got to get to a place with them where they have that self-actualization, where they say, I think I want this for me. I think I liked what I was feeling. Um, because if you're coming out and telling them you can't, telling them you can't, um, it, it's going to be a problem. So challenge them that if it's not addictive and if it's not a problem, you could totally stop it for 30 days. We should be able to stop just about anything for that amount of time. And then um, stick to those two things. I had, um, there was a, also a theme with four questions specifically around one of the things in Pennsylvania, um, one of your specific uh uh, conditions for um, getting a medical marijuana card, which is a failed opiate use disorder treatment. And the, the questions around that I, I thought were interesting, and maybe, maybe this last one sums it up well. Um, what role does marijuana play in lessening the cravings for opioids? And the answer to that is we don't know the specifics of that. But I can tell you that as a recovery guy, The answer to this, what we've always said inside of the recovery world, the answer to this is, is um, there's a spiritual solution to it. And all we gotta do is change everything. And um, if we're constantly looking for just the ways to take the edge off, what we can do is sort of cheat ourselves out of the, the beautiful gift that can wait on the other side, which is learning how to sit in the here and now without anything. Um, there was another question that asked specifically about, um, is it prescribed in conjunction with uh, Suboxone? And I'd like to remind everybody there um, that uh, THC cannot be prescribed. Marijuana can't be prescribed. Even in a medical state like um, Pennsylvania, it's a Schedule I controlled substance. So the only thing that is prescribed um, would be an FDA-approved um, uh, uh, drug that you would buy from your pharmacy. I, I prefer, I uh, think the one called Epidiolex is fantastic, but there's three of them. Um, uh, Marinol is interesting. Sativex is, is a little less interesting than Marinol to me, but Epidiolex is incredibly interesting. So um, it just depends on the school of thought that you come from, I guess. But I will tell you that in my world, I wouldn't uh, be able to sponsor somebody who was trying to replace an opiate use disorder with a cannabis use disorder. Because for me, that, that blocks that sunlight, um, you know, it keeps me from being able to get through to you and for you to get through to the, to the world, if you will. Um, I thought there was a fantastic one and it's specific and I hope you're still on. You asked um, if your son who's been in treatment um, and hasn't vaped since he's been in treatment, if, if he starts vaping when he comes home, is there a correlation between vape use and marijuana use? The answer to that is an absolute yes. Um, it's a double digit correlation. So all nicotine use for sure in um, inside those first maybe three years of uh, abstinence, we strongly discourage, but there is definitely a, a big um, uh, marrying of the vaping and the marijuana use. So you really would want to encourage your son to do everything that he can to keep from vaping. Tell him uh, how great it's going to be um, to avoid with COVID. Uh, we answered that one and we answered that one. Those are the starred ones that I have the most important. And again, I want to be considerate of your time. So Kim, I'm going to, to uh, uh, stop right now. Wow, Ben, thank you. That was amazing. We're all still here. We still have uh, a lot of people on the line. We have over 100 folks with us still. So that's just amazing. Um, and we do have a few more questions coming in. Um, there were a lot of questions about um, opioid use and signs of addiction to weed in particular, and um, maybe kind of in line with that, specific recommendations for a testing kit. Do you want to unshare your screen or do you want to go, oh, you're going to show some more stuff? No, let me show you this. So let's go back to the signs and symptoms of cannabis use disorder, or I'm sorry, substance use disorder. Sorry, I hope no, if you have a seizure disorder, don't watch for a minute. Um, you can look at these 11 as the, the signs for it, but what I would really encourage you 
um, to do with this is to uh, have a conversation with the professionals around and just uh, run it by them, knowing that, and for you parents out there, um, uh, a lot of the times we have a hard time um, seeing our own bias built into things. So bring a third party in, ask somebody like Kim. Um, Kim, I'm sure you've got great resources for this, but I would really, really encourage you to just consider these 11 as opposed to any cannabis specific stuff. Right, great. Um, and what about, if someone's asking about CBD oil as pain relief, um, Sure, right, why not? <laughs> sure, um, this is such a long conversation and, and I really don't talk about the medical because it's like, it's two hours worth of, but here's the deal with CBD. Most of what you have in your purse and your pocket sitting on your desk in front of you isn't really CBD. Um, it, it should, that should cost you about $120 a gram um, or a, a liquid ounce. Um, so don't, if it's the cheap stuff, if you got online, if it's probably ground up hemp, um, but yes, no problem using it topically. I've got no issues with this at all. Just know that most of it is marketing, less if it's actually CBD. Right. Um, you mentioned um, chronic use earlier toward the end of your talk and somebody asked, how would you define chronic use? Um, so what we're looking at that uh, as is basically anything more than about three times a week. Okay. And back to the testing question, um, specific recommendations for at home and also doesn't THC stay in the system about 30 days? So how does that affect testing? Oh man, what you're asking is, yes. So the at home testing can be fine. And I would um, tell you, there's a lot of good ones out there. There's a lot of drop-in sites that you can use. Um, we can set where those metabolites are so that we can tell if it's dropping. It, but realistically, um, they're still gonna be hot inside of those 30 days. What you're hoping for is that they aren't paying that close of attention to it. And um, that testing mechanism is gonna be something that helps. You need mass spec to tell levels of it. So interestingly, we actually can validate abstinence in a, a closed control group where people um, have tested positive as far as 73 days out from use. It's when they use chronic, um, really high potency stuff. Um, it's a really, it's actually been up to three months. It's an extreme outlier, but it's possible. So as far as Tesco, um, any of the strips that you would get from, you know, Dominion or, or whoever, uh, you can pick them up at, at most drug stores. Uh, and it, there's, there's drop-in centers all around you, I'm sure too. Okay, great. Um, here's, a, I think, a really good question. Given that it takes so long to detox from weed, uh, what do you recommend for residential treatment? It seems like the first 60 to 90 days can be almost useless, I guess. Um, you know, how will, and I know what she's talking about, um, how will residential treatment programs change, adapt to respond to the extended period of detox or psychosis? I'm going to give you the honest answer to that. Um, and this is the honest answer coming from somebody who uh, runs one of these programs is they won't change to adapt to the best practices because uh, the insurance companies barely want to give us two weeks to treat them anyway. And unless somebody is capable of writing um, a six figure check to take care of it, um, you're not going to have that change because the insurers just won't pay for it. So I would disagree in the first 60 to 90 days not being worth anything. Um, typically, I, I would tell you the first couple days, depending on, aren't worth anything unless it's a really, really good program and they can use that time to establish therapeutic bonds and create a feeling of safety for the person. If they can do that, we can jumpstart it. The reality is that uh, uh, treatment in this country is driven by what the insurers do and they're never gonna cover more than 30. If you are in a place where you can afford to pay for a year or two's worth of treatment, you should do that. The more treatment, the better. Um, but if you're not, if you're like most of the world who is insurance dependent, be very selective where you send them and know that not all tre treatment is created equal at all. We don't have standards. There's no national standard that we have to operate under. And so what you have, I, I mean, you guys, I, I know where you are. And I know that most of your people end up, um, you got some good treatment out there. You, you guys got uh, some good treatment around there. But you also get a lot of people pulled into New York and pulled down to South Florida from where you are. Um, and, and people who don't know um, their ass from a hole in the ground when it comes to, to treating substance use disorder. So just be very, very careful 
ask careful questions about it, do the research. And um, if somebody feels like they're trying to sell you on something, probably run the other direction because uh, the good ones don't sell them. Right, great, great, great answer. Um, can you advise, this is a good one, and it actually was asked previously a little bit too, how can you advise how we can do our best to halt this becoming legal in our state with regard to recreational use? Kim? <laughs> yes, sir? Can I uh, keep the pressure on, uh, listen, I, I, I don't know, I'm going to, um, this whole it's inevitable thing, the trains left the station, there's a part of that that's just um, a political kind of jockeying. Um, but I, I would tell you that your, your lawmakers really listen when constituents call. Yeah. And understanding what's actually at stake here, that it's not decriminalization. And I, I hope I don't irritate too many of you. I've always been fine with the idea of decriminalization. That what we're talking about is um, allowing a commercial market for another vice substance to take hold. Reach out to him. Kim, you know Pennsylvania better. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, we're not lobbyists. We don't go there, but we do like to educate and just help them to be aware. And unfortunately, you know, when we have um, these listening tours that kind of draw out a lot of people who are very much supporters of this industry, it, it sounds like that's the vast majority. And, you know, this is why I like to talk about um, just getting educated and understanding this. And I wish that all the, you know, all the questions that we had, we had what we have 40 some questions that were posed ahead of time. There was only one that was really sounding like, can you please help validate this wonder drug? You know, like pretty much it's all, how do I, and here's a, here's a question that I love that is so perfect for what we're talking about right now. What is the one greatest fact you can use to persuade addicts and others that cannabis THC in particular is dangerous? You know, this is what we got over and over again. This is what I hear, you know, almost daily from families. You know, I've got a 16 to 28 year old who will not stop dabbing. They've lost everything, every privilege, every relationship, their job, they're in the game room, they're not doing, you know, how do I convince them that their life is not great because they think it's perfectly fine. I wish that all these family members would be the ones that would say, this is our story. You know, how can you justify the, you know, seeing this only as an income generator for the state? So what is it? What is the one thing you can say to someone who, you know, somebody comes into your treatment center and I know this happens. They, the family brings them in. They don't want to be there. Oh, um, not for us. Cause we only treat consenting adults, but let's pretend. Oh, right. Yeah. You have, yeah. You're right. Well, well, so my son was 21 when he went to treatment. He did not think he had a problem, you know, so he got there eventually, thank God. But you know, they're consenting, but as long as, as long as somebody else is still kind of holding some cards, they can get their, you know, interventions. You guys take people that have had an intervention, okay. right? Okay, so let me try this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one with sort of two ways of saying it. Um, I, I would tell someone, I don't even really want you to answer me right now, because I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for you. Are, are you living your best life? and let them sit with it for a minute. Because the reality is that um, cannabis use is associated with something, this kind, this kind of use, problem use, is associated with something um, called uh, chronic apathy. And we know it's not on fire, things aren't terrible, you know, we're not um, getting arrested every weekend, but we're not living our best life. So that might be one that I ask them with us. Um, and then another way of maybe saying that, or, uh, would you, would you be interested in feeling what a couple of months feels like without this? Without, and, and if you are feeling a little bold, you can say without you having to have this as a part of your life. Would you be interested in feeling what the world feels like without it? And then if like, nope, 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 then you gotta say, man, that's, that's intense. That's intense. Think about that. Uh, and again, the, the way of saying it, the first way, that's one I, I, I do use quite a bit. And I tell them, hey, man, I'm not asking you to answer this question to me. I'm asking you to answer this question to you. Are you living your best life? Mm -hmm. Right. 
And I know, you know, as we were preparing for an intervention 10 over 10 years ago, um, one of the things that I learned is I may not be able to convince my loved one um, that their life isn't great, but I can certainly talk about what their, their substance use has done to my life. There's no refuting the fact that I can't sleep. I'm, I'm Googling all the drugs you're using. I'm, I'm obsessing. I'm, you know, my life is unmanageable. So there's no arguing with that. Um, and of course they can absolutely say, well, don't worry about me so much. Well, I can't help that. I love you, you know, and I want you to get well. So, um, I don't know. I think there's a whole lot we can do for, as a family member to, um, at least, you know, just get them into see a therapist with you. Maybe I'm overreacting. Will you come with me to see a treatment provider? You know, like I found this therapist who understands substance use. Um, let's go together. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm way out of line here, but let's go and talk to him or her and see what they have to say. Well, here, here's something else to try from a support group standpoint. Make sure that you, if if the, these are one of the questions you ask, go to an Al-Anon meeting, please. Um, make some friends, just try it. And the other thing is you could ask your loved one if they would attend a, um, a Marijuana Anonymous meeting. And now they're everywhere in the entire world. <laughs> uh, you can get on them anywhere. And the cool thing about them is they have other people with marijuana problems who know exactly what they're going through. So they'll walk in and be like, this is stupid, marijuana's not a drug, I don't have a problem. And then they'll have a room full of people who are like, ah, oh, brother, I feel you. I felt the same way three years ago. Exactly, I made that exact suggestion to somebody. Like now everything's online, so you can just sit there and listen. You don't even have to talk, you don't have to share, just we plant some seeds, hopefully. Um, someone has asked, what do withdrawal symptoms look like for a chronic user? Um, gosh, off the top of my head, I'll give you a couple and then I will tell you to look inside of the, the DSM, it's all online, the DSM-5, uh, withdraw for um, cannabis use disorder. So the most disturbing um, are uh, sleep, uh, anxiety, diet, and GI. And the reason why they're the most disturbing and, and typically the most severe is that um, they're, they're this cumulative itchiness that leads people to want to, to get out of treatment right away or to want to use again right away. Um, the biggest things that we see are probably the anxiety, the sleeplessness, um, issues eating. And here's an interesting thing is acute withdrawal lasts for about um, 16 days-ish, which is really interesting, and we don't have pharmacologic intervention that's much longer. And there tends to be a pretty big resurgence of symptoms, like around day 10, day 12, and they're more severe in females than they are in males. We think this probably has something to do with body mass index and the way that it metabolizes through your fat cells, um, but we're not totally sure. Um, but we, we do know that um, those are the things that we look out for and you can treat with other medications, but mostly what I tell folks when they're stopping, like just guys I'm sponsoring, not people in treatment, is like, hey man, sleep's gonna be really, really rough the next couple of nights, so how can we get you dog tired today? Cause you're going to have a hard time falling asleep. You want to meet at the gym? You want to go climbing? Can you go put 30 miles in on the bike? Um, can you get yourself tired somehow? Cause sleep's going to be rough. Eating's going to be rough. So what are you going to eat tomorrow? Let's get some of your favorite foods in the house. Um, that should help. Good. Great. Um, someone asked if the criteria that you described, um, you know, for determining whether or not somebody has an SUD or that a campus use disorder applies to other addictions and there's a lot of, lot of different things that take place for, depending on the substance, right? Yep, so what you're looking at here on your screen right now is um, that's not for cannabis use disorder, that's for a substance use disorder. So uh, the same criteria are used for all substances across the board, yes. Right. Um, yeah, and just kind of, oh, somebody had asked earlier, um, what do you think about Dr. Sanjay Gupta um, in the messages? that he carries about marijuana. And I think they're probably referring to, he made, he made Charles Webb pretty famous a number of years ago. I don't know if you're aware, but he has dialed back that conversation. Have you, are you aware of that? Very, yeah. Um, I, I think that, uh, oh, and, and you know, I don't, I don't know him. I've only shaken his hand once. I don't know him well enough to speak to him. But my feeling is a lot of these like uh, celebrity doctors, you know, I know some of the other ones on the mental health side, um, sometimes it can be a little bit more about the celebrity than the doctor. And while sometimes I listen to Dr. Gupta speak and I'm like, my goodness, that guy's brilliant. I mean, he's a neurosurgeon. He's brilliant. 
Um, on that, I thought, and, and this was when we had the conversation, I shook his hand, and the, I mean, you were just missing the boat on this. And it's more about sensationalism than it is about um, looking at the whole health. And I think one of the biggest issues that, uh, problems that he had, that he has walked back from, was um, the identification of an entire issue with an individual. Because that young lady's story, she, she lived um, 20 minutes from me. And I don't know if uh, you know, but she just passed away last month. Um, and what a little sweetheart from everything I saw and her parents were amazing people. The Stanley brothers are really cool guys, the guys who developed that strain. Um, but what he did was he allowed the entire issue to be seen through the lens of, of, um, her plight. And that's tough because when we're talking about public health and public health decisions, um, you've got to consider the aggregate as opposed to the individual. And it's so hard to do because there's so many terrible individual stories. So what I had suggested to him the, through what was that you should consider the individual story that it sounds like a lot of you have um, with the kid, with the husband, with it, because I can tell you some terrible stories there. Right. And, and also, you know, the, 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 she had the Dravet syndrome. So that's something that's treated with Epidiolex, which the FDA yes. approved in 2018. So unfortunately, they have been recycling those videos of her tragic life becoming much less tragic um, with the use of Epidiolex, which now Epidiolex, back when that, that um, news segment aired, it was all about Charles Webb, which was a strain in Colorado that was exclusive to that, that syndrome. But, you know, it's, it's it's a moot it's a moot argument today. It has nothing to do with what's happening in medical marijuana dispensaries. Right. I, I tried to write that as delicately as I could in my book. The chapter on medical was very difficult to to write, but I, I tried to write that that I think a lot of very very sick and very vulnerable people um, are are being used by folks who just want to make money by putting them on TV. Right. Right. Um, so lots of thanks and lots of, you know, here, I'm just going to share this last one because I think this is just such a tough and, and common problem. Um, 30 days, a year of therapy, 15 month program that didn't work for marijuana and only marijuana. It's, um, it's not addicting and helps me relax. My heart hurts for my 19 year old. It's not a my, question. I just wonder if you have any thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. They're easy. Um, my heart hurts for him too. One, you take care of you. Whoever wrote that, you get to some Al-Anon meetings. You reach out to Kim and to Judy. You reach out to the resources you have around you. And three, if you can get to them, which I'm sure you can, um, you can get my cell phone number. Because if we were at a conference, I would have just handed it to you. Um, and I want you to, um, if you get it from them, you can call and you can have your son call. And I rarely go through a week when I don't get an opportunity to do this. Maybe I won't fix anything. Uh, maybe I can help a little. Um, but you have, have got to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And my heart breaks for him too, and I'm so sorry. And um, I guess the last, here's where I'll end it for you. I'll sign out at this. Um, I was absolutely absolutely hopeless uh, and I don't go into my addiction stories because they're um, the same as so many people's they're pretty they're pretty rough um, I like my recovery stories because there's a lot more of them and uh, if I can make it if some of the guys in my life who I know and love uh, who have stories that would uh, curl your hair can make it um, so can he so don't give up hope and don't stop taking care of yourself um, because uh, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Absolutely. And we have that parent, Al-Anon and Ar anon are both great, as well as we have those online meetings for parents now. And I can absolutely tell you, you will not be alone because we specifically have parents who've got that same age group of kids who are dealing with mer with the high potency THC right now. So there's a there's just an awful lot of discussion happening and, and this has not helped. Us isolation has absolutely not helped. So um, please, please join us on Wednesdays at seven and um, just get some support. So, you know, thanks for bringing that up, taking care of them. I think we've just got lots of, I'm going to share, Ben, all of the nice comments that we're getting 
about how helpful this was. Um, really appreciate it. And if folks, when you leave this, when we end this, um, you'll be prompted to take a survey. We really want to hear from you. Even if you completed that survey before, um, please fill that out so we can know what we want to hear about in the future, if this was helpful to you or not. Um, any kind of feedback would be great. Um, and Ben, I don't know how to thank you enough. You're just such, um, you're such a treasure. I just am so honored and happy that we're friends and thank you. Me too. Next time I'll come out and uh, visit my little sister before it. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. That <laughs> sounds great. Thank you thank so you. very much. And thank you everybody for being with us. Really appreciate it. Take good care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>